The story is told of a king who lived several centuries ago and he could see the winds of war. He could feel the atmosphere change politically and he knew that there was an invasion that was imminent. And because he knew how war was waged in those days, he was very afraid. Because he knew that if he was conquered, the first thing the invaders would do would be to kill him and then to slaughter his family. And so he took his young son and he placed him in a peasant family's home so they could raise him as their own. And sure enough, things worked out exactly the way this king feared. The invaders came, they besieged the city, they laid waste to everything, and they slaughtered everyone who was left except for the people who were useful. And this went on for some time, and then there was this period of turmoil and finally a time of rebuilding. And ultimately, the people got stronger and the nation recovered and they led a revolt and they got their land back. They went to the village and they retrieved the king's son, who was now a young man, and they installed him in the palace and made him king. And this young man turned out to be an unmitigated disaster. Decision after decision after decision was faulty and terrible. And the land was soon plunged into turmoil once again. As one official said, the problem is, this man believes that he's a peasant. So he thinks and he acts like a peasant. He doesn't know he's a child of the king. And that is exactly what happens to many people in the church. We talked last week about identity, and we made the point that if we don't know who we are, then it is going to profoundly influence the way that we react and the way that we act. And today I want to build on that by talking about what Titus says through the words of Paul needs to be our focal point, our focus as we live our lives as ambassadors or representatives of God. We are not cultural or spiritual peasants. We are children of the King, and we need to think like that we need to act like that, and we need to share that with everyone who is out there. And that can only happen when we have that firm sense of identity. And so I want to bring you a story today from the life of Titus. Now, this is a man that we don't know a whole lot about. There is a letter that Paul writes to this young man, and obviously they're close because in the first chapter, Paul writes to him and says, Titus is my true son in the faith. And he's not just talking about the faith they share, he's talking about this bond that holds them together. And it's quite likely that Titus was converted by Paul. All we really know about the man is that he was a Gentile. He was probably a Greek. And we don't know other than that much, except that if you look at what we see portrayed in the New Testament, Titus is what you might call Paul's troubleshooter. Whenever there's a messy situation, whenever there's confrontation or whenever there's any awesome responsibility, Titus is Paul's go-to guy. And we know from a couple of instances in scripture that Paul sends him into these terrible situations. At one point, he has to send him to Corinth to straighten out some problems in the church there. At another time, he sends him to the island of Crete to establish the church and to make sure that everything is going okay. Crete had a reputation as a boisterous, a rowdy, and a dangerous place. And so Paul needed somebody that he could trust to have on the ground, to be his eyes and his ears, and to be the heart of Jesus. And so we know that this is an important, important man in the life of Paul, and he's a great example for us. I'm writing to Titus, my true son, in the faith that we share, he says. And then as we get into chapter 2, he says, as for you, Titus, as for you, you need to do what I asked you to do because there is lots at stake on this island. Now listen to this. I left you on the island of Crete so you could complete our work there and appoint elders in every town as I instructed you. An elder must live a blameless life. He must be faithful to his wife and his children must be believers who don't have a reputation for being wild or rebellious. A church leader is a manager of God's household, so he must live a blameless life. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered. 
he must not be a heavy drinker or violent or dishonest with money. Rather, he must enjoy having guests in his home and he must love what is good. He must live wisely and be just. He must live a devout and disciplined life. He must have a strong belief in the trustworthy message that he has been taught. Then he will be able to encourage others with wholesome teaching and show those who oppose it where they're wrong. Now, as I said, we don't know a lot about Titus, but I can tell you one thing. Paul is not going to send this guy anywhere, let alone to Crete, to establish and appoint church leaders unless he's got the characteristic that Paul wants in those people, those men that will be appointed. So when you read that list, when you see the attributes and the traits that need to be a part of any leader in the church, I think we can rightly assume that Titus has those things. And if you look at that list, humility and gentleness, the ability to deal with people, the ability to meet confrontation head on and yet resolve it with some kind of spirituality and faith. All of those characteristics are things that God expects of us. I think all too often what we do is we look to church leaders and those that are in positions of authority and we think that somehow they are different and they are special. In reality, we're all expected to have all of those traits. We all need to be people of integrity, maturity, stability, and trust in God. That's who Titus was. And that's what Titus does, is he goes around and he finds people who meet those criteria and he puts them in place just as Paul has instructed him to do through the counsel of God. But it's not just that. After he gets these instructions to go and do what he needs to do, Paul says, as for you yourself, you must be an example to these people by doing good works of every kind. Let everything you do reflect the integrity and seriousness of your teaching. So not only is Titus a wonderful example of what Christian character is supposed to look like in the real world, but the second thing we glean from this story is that your beliefs, my beliefs, they have to reflect in our behavior. Because if people see that we say one thing and we walk in a different way, that's going to undermine all the credibility, all the spiritual authority, and all the example that we might try to muster. We need to be people who walk the walk and not just talk the talk. And because we have Titus on the ground doing exactly those things, we know that the people that he's going to choose are going to be superlative. They're going to be people who can do the job because God has given him the ability to do that. And yet, one of the things we see in our culture is that there is this great divide. There are lots of people who look at life and they are completely me-centric. Everything revolves around them. And you can tell by the way they speak and by the way they live. And you know people like that. Maybe you've been people like that. But that's the choice, ladies and gentlemen. Our culture says it's all about you. You deserve everything that you can get. It's all about what you have, how you look, and the way you live. And Jesus comes along and he turns all of that on its head and he says, that's not it at all. It's not what you have. It's not even what you do. It's who you are, not just the identity that you have, but the way in which your identity is reflected in how you treat other people. Amen. We live in an age and in a place where we have permission to make us the focus. And so often in the church, that's exactly what we see. And so when Paul comes along and he tells us that it's not all about us, it's very hard for some people to get their hearts and their heads around that. And I will tell you that my biggest struggle every week is doing good. Not doing well. I'm doing just fine but I'm not interested in doing well. I wanna do good the way Jesus told me to do that. But it's a struggle for me. Because like you, I probably have a set of things that come fairly easy to me. And so I can do those things without too much turmoil in my life. 
I don't have to interrupt myself. I don't have to really exert much effort. I can just do it because, well, it's easy for me to do this and that and the other. But where I really struggle is when I'm called to serve in ways that are not convenient, at times that get in the way of what I want to do, other things that I prefer to be doing. Because the kind of relationship that Paul is talking about with God here is not one based on convenience, but based on conviction. We need to be available all the time. We need to be absolutely interruptible so that even when we've got plans, there are times when God is going to tap us on the shoulder and say, no, not now, because this is what needs to be done. And if we can't get to the point where we're willing to do that on a consistent basis, we're never going to be the sacrificial people that Jesus needs us to be. And remember what he said. Even unbelievers, they're really good about treating the people in their lives that they love in a very good and healthy way. You will do anything for the people that you love. The real standard is what happens when you have to deal with people that you don't love, that you find absolutely unlovely, people who are difficult or ungrateful, people who are angry and resentful, people that just make it hard for you to do what you need to do. Be who you need to be. One of the big questions that people often ask when they're presented with that big decision about whether they're going to come first or whether somebody else is, the big question is often, well, why should I? Well, Paul's going to address that in the life of Titus here. He says, here's how you need to be. For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures we should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God, while we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, and to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good works. And so I guess my big question for us today is, are we totally committed to doing good works or are we just totally committed to doing good works when it works out, when it's not going to cost us too much, when it's convenient for us, easy for us? Because that's the real distinction between people who are serving and people who are serving out of love and emotion. Yes, Titus is a wonderful example for us. Yes, we need to make sure that what we believe is reflected in the way that we behave. But the third thing that we have to understand is that to do good, that's what really reflects love and true devotion. That is what's going to set us apart. And that's never going to be easy, not for me and not for you. To do good means that we are serious about what we say we believe. And if we undermine that by not behaving in such a way that people know exactly what we think, what we teach, and what we believe, our witness goes nowhere. I think we all recognize that our own priorities get in the way, as Donna was saying, but sometimes we also worry about the reaction we're going to get from the people we're trying to serve. And when you've had some experience with difficult people, you know that sometimes it can blow up in your face. We've talked about this a lot. And the bottom line is that we need to do the right thing at the right time, in the right way, regardless of what the reception is going to be. We cannot afford to base our actions on what might happen, what could happen, or even what should happen. We need to do the right thing and then just take the consequences. And yes, sometimes people will be resentful. Sometimes people won't understand or they'll feel threatened for any number of reasons but it doesn't give us an excuse to ditch our responsibility and just do what we want. And scripture even deals with this. In Galatians chapter six, there's an interesting passage where Paul says, if you're in the church and somebody messes up, you need to help that person back onto the right path. And while you're doing that, do it with gentleness and humility and make sure that you don't yourself fall victim to the same kind of problem. But then he goes on to say, when people in the church are struggling, and I think we can make this 
about spiritual things or material things or physical things. Paul says, carry your own load. In other words, if you can do something, then it's your responsibility to do it. But then just after that, he says, but you also need to bear each other's burdens in the church and by extension to the people out there. So what's the difference between a load and a burden? Well, if I'm reading this correctly, it seems that a load is something that we can and should do on our own because we're perfectly capable of doing that and that's our responsibility. Whereas a burden is something that you cannot carry all by yourself. And that's when we need to step in and to help our brothers and sisters or to help people out there. And even in this book, Paul kind of addresses that. And in chapter three, he says, our people must learn to do good by meeting the urgent needs of others. Then they will not be unproductive. Now, I don't think that word urgent is there by mistake. I don't think it's random. I think the principle here is sound. There will be people who will make demands of you all the time. Sometimes those demands will be reasonable and sometimes they will be completely off the wall and it will not be reasonable, whatever their expectation of you might happen to be. I don't think that God wants us to step in and to rescue everybody every time they don't show responsibility for their own actions. And we need wisdom, we need discernment, and we always need love. When trying to figure out whether we need to step in or whether it's in the interest of the person we're dealing with to let them suffer the consequences of their own irresponsibility so they can learn and grow and mature. I will tell you that as a young minister, I spent a long time rescuing people from things I should have left alone so that people could learn from the experience. Because when we take upon ourselves the role of savior, when we figure it's our responsibility all the time just to do everything that everyone asks of us, it means that some things are gonna fall by the wayside. Because every time you say yes to something, you are automatically saying no to something else. And there are priorities that God wants you to set. So obviously, if we need to be helping anybody, it's the people who are struggling the most, but not necessarily those who are showing complete disregard for their own decisions and for their own obligations. So in a case like that, I think we have to pray. And we have to talk to these people and get the full story. And we have to decide on the basis of all of that what God would have us do. I think Christians struggle more with saying no than most people because we're conditioned, aren't we? To think that we are always supposed to say yes. We feel like we always have to put other people first and it should never be a case where we're elevating ourselves or giving our own personal preferences. But sometimes doing the right thing is not to do what other people want us to do. And I'm not saying for one minute that that's easy, but it is a struggle for all of us. You look at homelessness, you look at some of the needs in the community, you look at drug addictions, and you have to decide where you're gonna come down on some of those things and the right and discerning way to act because there isn't any kind of magic bullet. There isn't any one scripture you can turn to and say, okay, this is what I need to do, not with the specifics. We have spiritual principles, but one of the things God wants us to do is to use scripture and to use the Holy Spirit and to use our experience to discern not just what's right, but what's better and what's best. That's never gonna be an easy or a quick decision. So yes, there's lots at stake here, but Paul is very adamant that when we look at how we're supposed to live, It needs to be very specific. He says in chapter three, remind the believers to submit to government and to its officers. They should be obedient, always ready to do what's good. And by the way, it doesn't matter who the party is, it doesn't matter who the politician is, our obligation is to respect them even if we don't like them. And that does not mean you have to support every policy, but it really disturbs me when either the liberal prime minister or the conservative premier of Ontario is vilified in such a personal way where people swear at them and spit at them and treat them like dirt just because they do not agree with their policies. That is not what God would have us do, and he's adamant about that. 
Your people must not slander anyone and must avoid quarreling. Instead, they should be gentle and show humility to everyone. Can we do that? Once we too were foolish and obedient to evil. We were misled and became slaves to many lusts and pleasures, and our lives were full of evil and envy, and we hated each other. But when God, our Savior, revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, not because of the righteous things that we've done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out his Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because of his grace, he made us right in his sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to insist on these teachings so that all who trust in God will devote themselves to doing good. These teachings are good, and they're beneficial for everyone. And so what's the standard? Well, the standard is love, humility, gentleness, respect, dignity. It's doing good. And why do we do that? Well, we do that because God has been good to us. And if God can put us first, then we are obligated to put him and others first in our own lives. And again, that's counterintuitive. It's not something that comes naturally to any of us, but that's the calling and that's the mission. The last thing I really want you to understand is that motives matter. Sometimes we do the right thing, but we do it for the wrong reasons. And so it is with doing good. Yeah, I think there are three main reasons why people do the right thing for the wrong reason. Number one, they might do it for popularity or approval. It's all about them. It's about people saying, wow, look at what she's doing. Look how he loves, look at how he serves. But it's not about God, it's not about the people involved, it's about them. Motivation is everything. Reminds me of a story about a teenager, he's out playing basketball, he's shooting some hoops and he gets inside the house and he discovers he's lost his contact lens. So he goes out and he scours the driveway, he's just looking everywhere and he can't find it. Can't find it anywhere. So he finally goes to his mom and he says, I hate to tell you this, but I've lost my contact lens. And so she goes out spends 10 minutes, comes back, she's got it. The kid's kind of astonished. He says, wow, how, how did you do that? I looked everywhere on that driveway. She smiled and said, it's all about motivation. You were looking for a little piece of plastic. I was looking for $650. <laughs> and that is the reality of our lives. We are motivated by certain things. I also love the story about Colonel Harlan Sanders, you know, the Kentucky Fried Chicken guy. He's on an airplane. Colonel Sanders is on an airplane and he's heading for San Francisco. And there's a little baby in the back and, and this, this child is just wailing. And it's terrible because you can't hear yourself think anywhere in the airplane. The child is really upset. The air flight attendants do everything they can to try to fix the situation and nothing's working. So finally, this 89-year-old man in this wonderful little getup, he goes to the back of the plane and he soothes the child. Now maybe it was his gentle voice, maybe it was that white suit, the narrow black tie, we don't really know how he did it, but he did it and then he made his way back to his seat and the flight attendant went to him and said, thank you sir, I'm so grateful for what you just did. And the colonel smiled at her and said, oh, I didn't do it for you. I did it for the child. Do you see the point there? Sometimes we do things for us and not for the people we're serving, even if it just makes you feel good. And don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with you feeling good about the good things you do. But if that's the only or the primary reason that you're doing what you're doing, that's a wrong motive. So maybe it's popularity and approval. Maybe it's just how you're gonna feel about yourself. Sometimes it's about you feeling superior to other people because after all, look at what you're doing. Look at how much you pray. Look at how much you serve. Look at how much you love. And by the way, those people over there, they're not like me. Wrong motive. 
And there's one more motive that is absolutely wrong, absolutely unacceptable in the eyes of God. And that is when we love and when we serve because we think we're gonna earn or deserve our salvation. When you cannot accept a gift from God and you are intent on paying him back because you don't wanna feel beholden, that's a problem. Do you know people who live like that in the real world? They won't take anything from you because they don't wanna feel like they're beholden. They don't wanna to have to feel like they have to pay you back. They don't wanna to have to feel like they're not in control. And so a lot of times people will just refuse to let you do what you want to do. And maybe that was part and parcel of the situation we talked about earlier. Whatever the motive, we have to make sure that we fundamentally and essentially understand that there is nothing we bring to the table. There is nothing that we can be. There's nothing that we can do. There's nothing that we are that is going to make us able to deserve or earn what God has done for us through the blood and the sacrifice of his son. And so we need to serve and we need to love, but we need to do it for all the right reasons. So let's be the example of Titus, who is really the example of Jesus. Let's understand that what we believe must be reflected in how we behave. Let's put God first so that we telegraph to people that we understand the great debt that we ourselves owe. And let's recognize that motives matter and that doing the right thing for the wrong reason is destructive and hypocritical. And the last thing that I wanna leave you with is simply this. It's not about taking the easy way out. God calls us to do good. He does not call us to do good enough. May God bless us this week as we try to reach the standard of Jesus himself. Mm -hmm.